Welcome to this podcast series about networking. My name is Bruce Hartpence, a faculty member at RIT, and I will be your host. To find out more, you can visit us at www.nssa.rit.edu. Thanks for listening. All right, hello everybody. Today we're talking about Ethernet, and Ethernet is what we call a local area network protocol. It's what we use to connect to the network. So you take your Ethernet port, you plug in a Cat5 RJ45 terminated cable, send that to an Ethernet switch, and then all of your packet traffic is wrapped up inside an Ethernet frame. Now Ethernet, as a local area network protocol, lives at what we consider to be layer 1 and 2. So it doesn't have anything to do with IP addressing. It actually has two sub-layers. Uh, logical and control, which is primarily concerned with building the frame and handling the addressing. Also does a little bit of error control. And then the media access control sublayer is there primarily to determine whose turn it is to talk and when. Now there have been a lot of flavors of Ethernet, we'll talk about that later on. And the physical layer signaling is largely determined by what version of Ethernet you're running. Over the last couple of decades, there have been a lot of different kinds of Ethernet, and in fact, a lot of different kinds of other local area network protocols, such as FDDI and TokenRing. But Ethernet and 802.11 have largely taken over the world, pushing these other ones out. Today, we base almost all of our Ethernet topologies on unshielded twisted pair, UTP, or fiber. The naming convention, for example, 100 base T, means 100 megabits per second baseband transmission using unshielded twisted pair. Now, historically, Ethernet has been a bus topology. That's why it's in parentheses up there. But today, we almost entirely use switched star topologies. And all that means is that all of the nodes connect with an individual cable back to a switch or a hub. And between you and me, we don't like to use hubs anymore. Down at the physical layer, we have a couple of things to think about. The electrical and mechanical characteristics of the connector, the type of cable, and then the signaling. Now starting with the cable, UTP actually has four twisted pairs of wire. And of these, Ethernet uses two pairs or four wires. And you can see there under 10 base T that we actually use pins 1, 2, 3, and 6 and use an RJ45 connector. Pins 4 and 5 are actually telco connections. Now, 10 base T uses something called Manchester encoding to convey 1s and zeros in the electrical signal. 100 base T shifts that to NRZ and also uses a modified 4B, 5B. This is a little more than we want to do here, but the reason we use 4B, 5B is the clocks uh, weren't up to the speed that we needed when we shifted to 100 base T. So it's a little transition that we had to do to ensure that we didn't lose synchronization on the uh, NRZ encoding. Alright, so let's move on up to layer 2. What you're looking at here on top is the general frame format. All of the data that you send, web pages, email, games, they all fit inside that frame data area. The frame header is expanded uh, in the fields below. Regardless of what protocol you're talking about, we always break it up into fields. So again, starting from the left, we have the preamble uh, and the start frame delimiter, although we'll talk about that here in a second. The destination MAC address, source MAC address, frame type or control field, and there's the data field there, that 46 bytes to 1500 bytes, followed by the frame check sequence, and in Ethernet's case, that's actually a cyclical redundancy check, or CRC32. All right, so let's work through the first couple of fields here. First up, we have the preamble. And in parentheses, you see Ethernet type 2. I'll explain what that means here in a second. But really what we're looking at is 8 bytes of a 10101010 sequence. Now, the reason that we do that is so that network interface cards can sync up with each other. Remember that things are moving pretty fast on an Ethernet network, and we don't want to have any problems with the clocks. Following that, we have the destination address. This is the 
six-byte MAC address of the node that's going to receive this. It can be a host or a router or a switch, anything that's capable of communicating on the Ethernet network. Now the source address there, that's the MAC address of the sender. Again, six bytes. And this will always be what we call a unicast MAC address, which begins with 00. zero. Okay, the next field in our frame is actually the frame type, or what we call the control field. Now there are a couple of differences here, uh, and I'm going to talk about those again later on when I talk about what the start frame delimiter is, but the frame type really describes what you are encapsulating in the data field. So for example, if this was an IP packet, it would be coded with a 0800 value, and ART messages would be encoded with a 0806 type. The data field is next, and there are some rules here. But for right now, we'll just say that the minimum size for the data field is 46 bytes, and the maximum is 1,500. That means that if there's anything less than 46 bytes, you've got to stick some padding in there, usually in the form of zeros. And the last thing in the frame is, of course, that frame check sequence, or CRC32. So let's take a look at an actual frame caught via Wireshark. All right, so here we see an actual frame, and I hope that on whatever you're using to view this, you can see the frame fields accurately, but if you can't, you can always grab a copy of Wireshark. Now remember that you can't actually see the physical layer. The WinPCAP driver inserts itself after the NIC is done processing, so we won't see the preamble and we won't see the CRC32. But we can see the MAC addresses and the control field. So there's that destination MAC address. Now the value in parentheses is the actual value. And we can see the source address. And as I said before, this has to come from a particular node, and so it was a unicast MAC beginning with 00. So we see it there, 00111254349974. And there's our type field. We can see that there was an IP packet encapsulated in this, and so there's the value of the control field sitting at 0800. This is a two-byte field. On any given Ethernet network, there's actually a couple of different types or flavors of Ethernet frame, 802.3 and Ethernet Type 2. Now, Ethernet Type 2 frames are used for data, so IP packets will be encapsulated in Ethernet Type 2. And management frames, such as spanning tree or some vendor-specific protocols, uh, will be encapsulated in 802.3 frames. There are two major differences between the two. Uh, an 8-byte preamble in Ethernet Type 2, and a 7-byte preamble and a 1-byte start frame delimiter, which is just a slight variation in the 1010 pattern. But the big difference for us is that control field. In Ethernet Type 2, it is going to be uh, an indication of what's being carried by the frame. In 802.3, it's actually a length field. So the length field will always have a value of 1500 or less all Ethernet Type 2 values will be greater than 1500. All right, so here we have our two types of frame. On the right, we've got that Ethernet Type 2. This is very similar to the one that we looked at earlier, except that it's an ARP message, and so it has a different code in the control field. But the rest of it is very similar. On the left, you've got 802.3. Now we've got our source and destination MAC addresses there, but we also have a length field instead of the control or type. Now this length field indicates that the frame is 38 bytes or has a 38 byte payload, and so we have to have those corresponding zeros to pad it out to 46 bytes to make sure that we don't violate the minimum data field size rule. Now the rest of it uh, is just a header for whatever is encapsulated in the data field. I know it's a little confusing because it says logical link control, but it's not actually part of the Ethernet frame itself. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about MAC addresses. Now MAC addresses are also known as physical addresses or hardware addresses, but it's all the same thing. What we're really doing is identifying the NIC or interface on a device. Now no two MAC addresses are the same and they're broken up into two parts. The first three bytes are for the vendor, really two of the first three bytes. Uh, 
And then the last three bytes are actually a unique serial number for an individual host. So no two computers are supposed to have the same MAC address. Now a vendor can actually have a number of different codes associated with it, so Cisco actually has a whole bunch. In addition to the address for a particular host and the vendor, a MAC address can also tell us what kind of message we're dealing with, and we'll see that here in the next slide or two.